the contest scene was the exchange of idea and progression of the sport. It makes me do things that I'm not comfortable with and that's a good thing because it makes me do better. If you want to consider yourself to be one of the best in the world, you've got to be able to win these, these major contests. Everybody wants to win. We just got to push the sport, do new tricks to, to be able to win. 30,000 people yelling my name and you just stand up there. I still have it in my ears. That was a nice feeling. Nobody can take that away from you. It's just, it's just you in that moment. Competition is in human nature, but that was far from the thoughts of the early pioneers in the 1900s or those of Mr. Sherman Poppin of Michigan. In the Christmas of 1965, he invented the snurfer. This changed the history of snow sports. Snurfing is adaptable to all age groups for play or for sport. There are outrageous hot doggers and there are Sunday snurfers who coast down the hill. Snurfing quickly took off and competitions were the natural next step. By 76, there were over a million snurfers sold worldwide. Bindings were the next key ingredient for control and speed, with Tom Sims and Jake Burton Carpenter leading the innovation. I didn't invent snowboarding, I just helped push it along. Snowboarding evolved, you know, it's just, it's been there, the concept has been there for a long time. Snowboard competition became the testing ground for new products, with Jake Burton on the East Coast and Tom Sims on the West. With us today is one of the world's great champions. Here is Tom Sims, right here. So the contests are getting better, the kids are getting better, and uh, more ski areas are opening up, so it's all up from here. By 1982, there was the first US national championship at one of the more welcoming resorts, Suicide Six in Vermont. You know, the early competitions were fun because it was basically all about just a straight shot down the hill. By 1983, there were two disciplines, downhill and GS. These honed the rider's skills and pushed the development of the boards. The event became the iconic US Open. In the same year, Sims created the World Championships and had the first ever halfpipe competition. Burton threatened to boycott. He said it wasn't part of snowboarding. Viva snowboards. All right. Yeah. While Sims and Burton were battling it out in the States, there were some Europeans inspired by their activities. In the beginning of the 80s, we saw magazines with pictures of America. We started to copy the stuff that we saw on, on photographs. The first time I competed was uh, 1985. It was the first time that a European showed up to compete against the famous Americans at the time. Jose was kind of like the role model snowboarding. He was kind of an icon for snowboarding. He had like long hair and he would like wear like fluorescent clothes at the time and everyone was like, wow, you know, that's crazy. You never see anyone like that in the snow. Most of our critics said, yeah, but it's only for powder. By competing, we proved very quickly that we are very reliable on packed snow, even on ice. So that's why the Alpine disciplines very quickly developed. That's how we sort of started to develop boards for hard pack. And then we approached some, some real small ski areas and they let it happen. They let us go because they just wanted the money. By 1985, the first Burton US Open was held. And back then, it was all about speed with cat suits and race boards. But Alpine racing on a snowboard just didn't do it for some of the more skate oriented riders. Legendary Terry Kidwell and friends brought some style to the snow and pioneered half pipe riding. We found this ditch in the summertime and we went there in the winter after we got a little snow and we built a couple kickers off the, off the end and it was one of the first quarter pipes in snowboarding. Kind of make a, 
there. Snowboarding a little more of a skateboard yeah. style. The half bikes had to be shaped by hand and were generally natural gullies in the side of the hill. The sides were variable and inconsistent, but captured the imagination of the riders at the time. The big change was uh, the freestyle, uh, the judging. Because skiing and everything, you, you, uh, you count the seconds, you count the time. And then with snowboarding, it was the first time when you just had an overall impression. They just voted the best rider from uh, what they felt like. It was no special rule, which just what the freestyle was about in those days. Freestyle shaped the future of snowboard competition and was where a legendary rider from the American Northwest would carve out his name. Already the winner of multiple national championships in alpine disciplines and an accomplished free rider, it was freestyle that gave him his iconic status. First world title I won was in 1986, and that was at the Breckenridge World Snowboarding Championships. I won the half pipe title there. Um, I realized I really want to start going to some competitions to learn more about snowboarding and have fun in this little brotherhood of pro snowboarding at the time. His style was unique, plus uh, his results were amazing for years and years and years. Stood up for what he thought was right, and that made him so special. There are some types of people, some types of sportsmen, and Craig Kelly uh, is the same like Terry Harkinson, the same like Sean White. You just have special people, special heroes, which will always be the best, and he was, he was the first one in snowboarding. By 1989, the now iconic US Open had their own halfpipe competition, and Craig Kelly again proved his dominance against the best in the country, winning another national title. By the end of the 80s, Freestyle had captured the imagination of the snow-going youth, including the young Sean Palmer. With racing brushed aside, episode two documents the style and attitude that made the 90s a defining decade.